Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pulad Yunusov. Uh, I'm with Yunusov Law Professional Corporation here in Toronto, Canada. I'm a commercial litigator. I uh, really like asking questions, meeting with interesting people. And today we are going to have a chat with a really interesting person, especially if you're into bankruptcy and insolvency. I just want to uh, let you know ahead of time that this is an informational session and uh, none of this uh, meeting constitutes legal advice. I will uh, pass the floor to my guest and let him introduce himself now. Tom? Great, Thank, thanks, Pilad. So uh, my name is Tom McElroy. I'm a licensed insolvency trustee. Uh, my firm is Albert Gelman, Inc. Um, a little bit about myself. I, I started off as a chartered accountant um, and became a chartered business evaluator, chartered insolvency and restructuring professional, but principally my practice and that of my firm relates around our status as licensed insolvency trustees. Um, we're a firm of four licensed insolvency trustees. Um, the office consists of about 10 people. Our principal office is downtown. And we've got satellite offices throughout uh, the GTA. We help individuals as well as small and medium sized businesses in financial difficulty. We also work with lenders, whether secured or unsecured, um, in certain enforcement activities. Thanks, Tom. Let's start with the basics. What uh, a license, what is actually a licensed insolvency trustee? Uh, what do they do? Yeah, so, so a license, and, so, and, and I will be looking a little bit to my left here sometimes. I've got some notes. I don't, I don't want to miss anything. Um, and we've got some, some, some items I'd like to discuss. Um, but uh, so a licensed insolvency trustee is, a, uh, a, is, is an individual who's been granted a license by the Office of the Superintendent of Bankruptcy. Um, there's about 950 individuals that, in Canada that hold the license. The license is specific to Canada. Uh, only folks in uh, with with the the license the the LIT license uh, can assist individuals and businesses in bankruptcy and formal restructuring matters, uh, and can act as receivers um, in in court appointed mandates. Um, so the process to becoming a a, a licensed insolvency trustee um, starts with obtaining what's called a Chartered Insolvency and Restructuring Professional Designation. CARP, which governs that organization, is closely aligned with the OSB, although they are certainly separate. Uh, that process used to take about five years. Now it's possible to get through it in about two and a half, three years, although typically most folks uh, take about four, four or five years to get through that process. From there, you make an application to the Office of the Superintendent of Bankruptcy, the official, what we call the official receiver. Um, you attend it, an oral examination, uh, and and then they decide whether to grant or not grant you a license. And 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 then um, if you are granted a license, you become a licensed insolvency trustee. Uh, thanks, Tom. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I believe that bankruptcy and insolvency in Canada is governed by federal legislation. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So one of these uh, uh, pieces of legislation is the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. So, all right. Uh, so, sorry. So the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, uh, as you quite correctly mentioned, is, is one of the principal statutes in Canada. It's a statute for a lawyer, obviously, they know what a statute is. It's a set of laws um, uh, that govern um, how bankruptcy and restructuring proceedings for certain individuals and corporations um, shall proceed in Canada. It's a fairly rigid statute. It's meant for, for um, to, to apply to situations where individuals, you, me, you know, Uncle Bob, are in financial trouble and need to resolve those particular debts, as well as small and medium-sized companies. Um, it, as I mentioned, it's a very rigid statute, so there's uh, it's quite thick. Uh, there's a lot in it. Um, case law has developed over you know many years also to to, to play a role, but really it governs um, how individuals and small and medium-sized businesses uh, 
restructure or, or file formal bankruptcy. Uh, yes, so when I hear the word statute, legislation, uh, act of legislature, so in this case, it's an act of parliament of Canada, uh, the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, I'm thinking uh, public policy. I'm thinking that uh, a legislature, in this case, parliament, decided that it was important to codify certain rules about how to deal with insolvent uh, businesses, for example, or people. I'm curious, if you were to use five or 10 words, what would you say was the rationale? Why do we have the insolvency legislation? What is the purpose of this regime? What is the purpose of uh, creating the institution of trustees? Why do we have uh, the codified bankruptcy and insolvency regime in Canada? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and and it, it is um, not unique in Canada, but, but it's certainly uh, the, um, the, the creation of the trustee is, is, a, is a unique thing insofar as in the U.S. there aren't trustees or trustees are, you know, lawyers who are familiar with the legislation. Here there's a clear distinction between the trustee as the court officer who administers the process and the, the advocate being the lawyer who's representing their client. Um, to get to the heart of your question, which, which again is a great question, um, I would say that for individuals, it's certainly a rehabilitation. Um, as I mentioned, you know, when I speak and, and, and to my clients, um, if you have insurmountable debt as an individual and you aren't able to, in some formal way, um, uh, either reduce that amount or eliminate it, you're, you're not going to be a productive member of society, right? If this debt continues to burden you for the rest of your life, uh, what incentive are you going to have to get up in the morning, go out and be a productive member of society? So really it is, um, you know, and what they say is that you have the honest but unfortunate debtor, um, and this is a rehabilitation statute. For corporations that file uh, bankruptcy, it's a mechanism to end the corporation that can't otherwise be done through a dissolution because they're insolvent. Um, but again, it's also a rehabilitation for a corporation to restructure uh, while it's in financial difficulty. And um, it, certainly in my experience, it's much easier to uh, restructure an existing business that's been set up than, to, uh, than for the government using this legislation to, to allow that business to continue than for the government to incentivize somebody to start a new business, right? So it's, okay. it's, it's um, a rehabilitation uh, and, and also a means to end corporations that otherwise are no longer viable. Uh, Tom, in my experience, one of the objectives that um, govern judges, because I'm a litigator, in insolvency matters is preserving the value of, of the assets of the insolvent entity. Would you say it's also one of the uh, legislative purposes uh, uh, in Canada? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, they, what, what the term that gets thrown around or, or the, the phrase that gets turned around is um, without these restructuring proceedings and the stay of proceedings that kind of fends off the creditors, it's, it's kind of the first one to get there um, the first creditor to get there that would really benefit. What what the insolvency process does, as you quite rightly mentioned, is it freezes out enforcement activity for the most part and allows the debtor company to operate in an environment, albeit they're still in distress, but an environment free of enforcement activity so that they can preserve value uh, to either restructure the debt Mm -hmm. in the company or ultimately to, to undertake some type of process uh, to sell the business as a going concern and ultimately the creditors benefit from that what what happened um, you know back back you know when these laws weren't around is that you know the first one to get into court get judgment start enforcing mm -hmm. uh, you know was doing so to the detriment of all the other creditors so this is really a forum the restructuring um, of a company is really a forum uh, to allow all creditors to participate without thinking that they've got to be the first one you know, to the finish line. Mm -hmm. um, 
I want to keep this uh, chat approachable to uh, lawyers or accountants or other professionals who are watching us today, but I, I still want to get into some nuts and bolts of your job, of your work. And uh, it's interesting that you say uh, uh, that trustees protect all creditors in a sense uh, from the strongest, the most aggressive creditor who will take uh, take it all uh, without the uh, bankruptcy regime. Uh, but um, what are the tools that trustees have at their disposal to hold back the uh, aggressive creditor to uh, essentially uh, make peace, uh, keep the peace, and protect the value of the asset? If you yeah, told it's a great us about question. It. Yeah, great question again. So uh, essentially when somebody files a restructuring, what I mean by restructuring, if it's a corporation um, and it's a small or medium-sized business, it's, it's really a, a proposal process. Uh, for the lawyers, it's called a division one proposal in part three of the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. Um, and, 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 re, and the way that that process is, is usually initiated is by the filing of a notice of intent to make a proposal, which is, as it, as it you know, says, it's a notice um, that can be filed very quickly um, where the, and, and the trustee files it with the government. So if the client comes in and says, you know, there's a creditor that's about to garnish the bank account or seize assets or whatever the case is, um, it, you know, there's been situations where we meet in the morning, uh, we do our due diligence throughout the day, and then we file the notice with the government in the evening. And effective the date stamp, uh, the time of filing, there, there becomes a stay of proceedings. Now that stay of proceedings is, with certain um, limited exceptions, applies to all creditors, whether it's CRA, uh, the landlord, uh, a litigant, um, an execution creditor, a supplier, a utility, whoever it is, the stay of proceedings with, with certain limited exceptions applies automatically. So our next step is then to send to all those creditors a notice saying, look, stop, there's a, there's a legal stay of proceedings um, and you cannot enforce. And, and for the most part, creditors get that. Where there is a litigation creditor, uh, in the process of either uh, trying to obtain judgment or executing, we send a copy to the lawyer as well as to the court. Uh, of a, and it's called the Notice of Stay of Proceedings, specifically to the court, it becomes part of the court file, and the, the, the proceeding is stayed. Um, and, and so that really is the mechanism that stops all, again, with certain limited exceptions, all creditors from, from continuing their enforcement activities. This is a very important tool. It's, it's essentially the uh, means to broadcast your powers, your status to creditors, and uh, let the creditors know that everything is on pause until you sort things out. Uh, but once you do that, uh, do you take control of the insolvent entity's assets, for example? Do you sell them? Do you uh, auction them off? How does that work? Yeah, um, again, a great question. So we, the trustee's role in, in a restructuring proposal scenario is really as a monitor. So we monitor the business, right? Because all of the creditors have now been frozen out. You need a third party in there to monitor and report back, to say everything's occur, you know, every all all of the activities of the business are continue to um, occur in the ordinary course. No assets are being dissipated. Um, the the company is able to maintain a positive cash flow during this restructuring proceeding, um, and 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 to basically report to the creditors. As a trustee in a proposal, we do not take in very limited, certain limited circumstances we might, but generally speaking, we do not take possession of the assets. The company is what we refer to in the industry, debtor in possession. 
So they continue to operate their business in the ordinary course. The employees are still employed. The obligations, the post filing obligations continue to uh, be paid by the company. So for exa example, if they want more supply or they want to continue to lease a piece of equipment, they've got to pay for that on an ongoing basis. But the trustee doesn't take possession. Uh, with respect to um, selling assets, the, the legislation, uh, although I, I believe when it was conceptualized and put into to law, it, it really contemplated a, um, a restructuring and continuation of the business. A lot uh, of companies now are entering proposal restructuring proceedings with the objective of selling the assets. And one of the benefits of selling assets within a proposal proceeding is that A, you, you, there's no threat from enforcement from, from your creditors, but also when you run that process and you find a buyer, you go to court to get approval of the sale and you get an order severing all liability from the assets. So the purchaser knows that they're buying the assets free and clear of any and all encumbrances. It's called an approval investing order. There's a standard order on the commercial list uh, website or commercial list site. Um, and, uh, and, and so the purchaser buys knowing that there, there won't be any issues in, in purchasing these assets. Thanks, Tom. So you've been talking mostly about the proposal proceedings. Uh, what other uh, bankruptcy or insolvency proceedings are there? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, a proposal is a restructuring, and then there's the what what most folks would be uh, familiar with, or the term anyway, would be bankruptcy. So in a bankruptcy, the trustee does take possession. So for example, if there's a company that that files a bankruptcy or an individual, and there's a piece of real property, the trustee, depending on the circumstances, but the bankrupt's interest in that property vests in the trustee. Mm -hmm. Similar to any accounts receivable, inventory, equipment, it, it vests in the trustee and subject to any security over those assets, it's the trustee's responsibility with the direction of creditors to realize on the value of those assets, mm -hmm. liquidate, and then distribute to creditors. So bank the, the bankruptcy process really is a, a liquidation process. Um, whereas the restructuring may be a liquidation, but usually as a going concern, or or simply a restructuring of the debt on the balance sheet. Right. So is it fair to say then that there are two major categories uh, of uh, insolvency pr proceedings? Restructuring, where we talked about proposals and monitors, and bankruptcy, where we talked about liquidation, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. All right. So could you tell us when um, a, a, an entity, uh, an insolvent entity might choose um, one or the other? Yeah, uh, great question. So, and this is something that, that you know, we, we as trustees, licensed insolvency trustees deal with all the time. So um, every situation is unique, obviously, um, but generally speaking, if, if a business owner comes to me, with an operating business where there is goodwill uh, that has the potential to be um, to be realized on, uh, we wouldn't necessarily recommend shutting down the business. Now, this also depends on the owner's appetite um, to enter into this process. Um, but generally speaking, if there's an operating entity that could be sold on a going concern basis, I think all parties would agree at that point that that the value that could be realized by selling through a restructuring um, would be greater than the trustee coming in, shutting everything down, terminating the empl employees, and liquidating. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, it's 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 certainly very much less common for trustees to operate businesses uh, because trustees become personally liable, and that liability uh, is not something that a lot of trustees want to take on. Um, but uh, it's, so a lot of sales uh, where, there's, where there is uh, a going concern or goodwill value are, happen through a restructuring. Now, if a client comes to me and says, look, I'm a general contractor, 
Um, I was operating for 10 years, but I had three bad jobs. They ruined me. I'm being sued by ABCD supplier. Um, I've got no money. And what do I do? Well, that's a, let's put it into bankruptcy. And there's a couple of reasons. One, generally, very generally, putting something, putting a company into bankruptcy is essentially a dissolution of an insolvent company. It, it is and it isn't, but you can't dissolve an insolvent company. So how do you stop the requirement to, to continue to have to file taxes or tax filings? Um, you put it into bankruptcy. Notice is sent to all the creditors, including the litigation creditors. And so uh, generally speaking, an individual, or the owner of a business that is no longer operating now doesn't have to defend these actions because the bankruptcy automatically provides for a stay of proceedings as well. Um, the, the tax benefit uh, or potential tax benefit from putting a company into bankruptcy is that oftentimes small, medium-sized businesses, the shareholders inject personal funds by a shareholder loan. Um, if a company if, and, and the accountants who, who may be participating would, would have better knowledge uh, than I do, um, but the, the uh, benefit of putting a company into bankruptcy is that it, it makes the process of requesting an allowable business investment loss uh, from the CRA for the personal shareholder much easier. Um, this, this loss, like let's say the individual invested 300 grand in the company, it went bust, now there's a shareholder loan that they're not gonna be repaid, put the company into bankruptcy so they know they're not gonna get the money back. The accountant does what they need to do to apply for the allowable business investment loss. The shareholder, if granted, the allowable business investment loss will have um, a loss that they can apply going forward to all sources of income, whether it's employment, capital gains, whatever the case is. So it does have significant value. Um, yeah, I think, I think I've answered your question. Yeah, uh, oh, definitely. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but both proposals and bankruptcies stay proceedings, right? Immediately, yeah. So this is what 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 they have in common: the state of yeah. proceedings. Also, a court appointed appointed officer in both cases, a monitor in the case of proposals, and a bankruptcy trustee in the case of bankruptcies. Correct? Yeah. Not to be too technical, a monitor. Uh, we're called the proposal trustee. The proposal trustee. Proposal. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, a question from the perspective of creditors. Which one will uh, uh, generate greater returns for creditors? I know that every case is different, but uh, is it possible to say that one or the other will generate more cents on the dollar uh, for creditors? Generally speaking, a proposal will always generate more cents on the dollar. So the way that we frame it, um, maybe I'll back up and get, give, uh, a couple more building blocks here just just so that everybody's um understands why creditors would would agree to a proposal but um in order for a proposal to be approved creditors representing uh, two-thirds in value and 50 percent in number have to be on side with it mm -hmm. right so you can't just file a proposal get your stay of proceedings mm -hmm. and then make you know an offer for nothing to your creditors mm -hmm. right you can but then they will vote against it and then the company will be automatically bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So what, what happens is the company uh, and the trustee do an evaluation to say, okay, here's, the, uh, here, here's what the company can afford to pay its creditors if it's allowed to continue and restructure its debt. Mm -hmm. And here is what the creditors will get in a bankruptcy. So let's say in a bankruptcy, the creditors will get half a million bucks because assets would be liquidated, accounts receivable will be collected, et cetera. Well, no creditor is gonna vote in favor of a proposal that provides for less distribution than half a million dollars. So essentially it's a quid pro quo where the, the company says, look, we'll give you more than you would get in a bankruptcy. Um, and you, we, as long as you vote in favor of, of, of the proposal. And let, um, us stay, so, let us stay afloat, right? That's right. That's right. And there's a couple of, you know, if, if it's a supplier and you continue to get supply from them, not only do they get more 
um, in the proposal than they would in a bankruptcy, but they continue to have a customer. Um, All right. Albeit the relationship may be strained, but uh, you're probably paying COD at that point anyway, or cash on, on delivery. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> so generally speaking, a proposal will always provide for more um, mm -hmm. than, than a bankruptcy. And by the way, all, all of these proceedings are public, so it becomes public knowledge, right? Yeah, so that's a very good question. You're right, they are public. Um, it's, it is a public process, uh, but it's not as though it's, it's, it's broadcasted. Mm -hmm. uh, so if a client comes to me and, you know, in a very simple situation where they get reassessed by CRA and they owe a million bucks in HST or something, mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't broadcast, that doesn't get broadcast to every creditor in Canada and, uh, you know, in the news, whatever. The, our statutory responsibility is to provide notice to the creditors affected by the proposal, mm -hmm. the debtor company, the right. and the, obviously the Office of the Superintendent of Bankruptcy. So although, yes, it is public and it is public record, mm -hmm. um, the, the parties di that receive direct notice would be the, the creditors. Um, a question. Where do receiverships fit in all of this yeah absolutely so so a receivership um, so there's two forms of receivership there's a private receiver which essentially the the, uh, the the let me back up one step so a receivership the difference between a bankruptcy and a receivership is a, a receivership is a process that is driven by secured debt so you are appointed a trustee would be appointed to be a receiver to realize on assets secured by a particular or several creditors. Uh, a bankruptcy is a process driven by unsecured creditors, uh, where the trustee works um, to, to administer the process of the bankruptcy for unsecured creditors. So if you're a secured creditor that is owed, make it round a million bucks, um, and there's an, op there's an operating business or there's a piece of real estate or whatever the case is, um, you would appoint a trustee to be the receiver to go in and realize on your security and pay you back first. There's two ways to do that, generally speaking. You can do it by way of a private appointment where the terms of the general security agreement would dictate how the receivership is, is to unfold. Or you go to court, which these days is, is, is the much more uh, a common approach um, simply because there's too much liability to go in as a private receiver for trespass, improvident realization, etc. So mm -hmm. most of the time uh, secured creditors make applications to court to appoint a receiver by court and then the, the court, uh, the, the, um, the process is a court-driven process uh, so all of the creditors um, will be kept apprised of what's happening. If any assets are sold, the, the sale gets approved. So the uh, process for improvident realization is mitigated significantly. And then ultimately, if creditors need to uh, pursue personal guarantees, they can you know, do that uh, afterwards. But of course, the lawyers would know much more about that than I do. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So when you talked about receivership, uh, I think you said that it's secured creditors that drive that process, right? Yeah. So essentially, it's a form of collecting the secured debt. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, we work for, for several financial institutions. So if there's a, uh, a receivership really is the last step uh, in, in enforcing. Um, so if you're a, a lender and um, you've entered into forbearance, uh, with with the debtor company, and they I, one of the terms would be, depending would be that they would consent to the appointment of a receiver or something like that if you enter into a forbearance agreement. Um, but really, the relationship has broken down between the lender and the debtor, or it becomes you know abundantly clear that this business can no longer operate profitably, and that there would be an erosion of the security. What I mean by that is AR would be collected. Uh, just to fund operations and and mm -hmm. and um, or or equipment would continue to be used and degraded, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then you would appoint a receiver to stop everything, 
lock out the company, uh, literally change the locks on the door, liquidate everything, um, and 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 then repay the uh, the secure creditor whatever they're owed um, up to the to the balance of their outstanding debt. Very interesting. Uh, so of course, unsecured creditors do not have access to receivership. Do they have their own tools to um, use bankruptcy and insolvency proceedings to collect unsecured debts? Can they force a bankruptcy involuntarily, for example? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so th th as I mentioned before, the bankruptcy process is, is a process driven by unsecured creditors. Um, and so if you're a creditor owed more than a thousand bucks and you can uh, convince, of course, it's much more complicated than this in, in, in actuality, but the two uh, general thresholds that need to be met are you're owed more than a thousand bucks and you can prove that the uh, debtor, whether it be a company or an individual, has committed an act of bankruptcy, which are spelled out, those acts are spelled out in the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. Um, then, then the court will be in a position to grant an order adjudging the debtor company bankrupt at that time, right? So you go to court, you start the application to put the company into bankruptcy. Um, if you consent, you go to court, you get the order effective, I guess, when the order is entered, um, the, the debtor is bankrupt. Um, if they appeal or, or they oppose, sorry, not appeal, if they oppose uh, the, the, the application, then it may drag on, um, but it would be unsecured creditors that are owed money that would start that process to put the individual or business into bankruptcy. And there's a couple of reasons why that might happen. Let's say you're um, uh, litigating and um, you're owed a million bucks, unsecured, owed a million bucks, and the, the, there's real property involved and that real property um, is transferred. For whatever reason, they're able to transfer it. Um, the bankruptcy and it's, and it's transferred to a related party. The Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act when, when says that when you start that application, you preserve dates. And what I mean by dates are uh, dates related to transfers at undervalue or preferential payments. So um, let's say they transfer the property to a related party uh, who, who, who's now holding the property. Um, the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, if, if there is a bankruptcy, and the trustee steps into the shoes of the bankrupt individual, what would happen is that the trustee would then go to court and say that this transaction was improper um, and, and uh, at that point would, would try and get an order reversing the transaction. Now in bankruptcy, uh, you don't need to prove intent. Uh, within one year of the transaction happening um, and, and uh, and, and the date of bankruptcy or the date that the application is started. Um, the other benefit too to unsecured creditors or in a bankruptcy process is that you can examine creditors, management, anybody who ought to have reasonable knowledge of the affairs of the bankrupt individual under oath without a court order. If the trustee believes that there's reasonable uh, grounds to examine somebody to determine um, the causes of insolvency, uh, the location of books and records, the location of assets, uh, the trustee can compel that person to attend it to an examination without a court order. Um, we can also compel records from banks, financial, and other financial institutions, other third parties. Um, so an, an unsecured creditor who is concerned about dissipation, di assets dissipating while they're litigating um, can start that process to put a company into bankruptcy or an individual to preserve those dates. Um, and then ultimately, once they're in bankruptcy, the trustee can utilize its powers to reverse th those transactions, um, obtain the necessary documents, uh, and move forward. Also, if there's a fraud um, or, or the, the creditor believes that there is a fraud, the trustee has significant powers to investigate that fraud. So essentially, while simply commencing a, an action in court is fairly passive, uh, yeah. And there is an alternative debt collection tool where a court appointed officer simply takes over the debtor and uh, does certain things to prevent improvident transactions or uh, sells the asset uh, you know, to uh, realize the maximum value for creditors. Uh, 
compared to simply starting an action of superior core that seems very active and aggressive to me and seems like a very powerful debt collection tool. Yeah, the bet so the bankruptcy application is, you know, significant relief, right? You're putting somebody into or, or a company into bankruptcy. So it is significant relief. Um, if they're defended, sometimes it takes a while. Um, if they're not defended, um, then you get the order. Um, but mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it certainly is significant relief that you're requesting. So it's interesting. So the uh, a creditor starts a, the bankruptcy application, but the debtor can oppose it, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, their argument is I haven't uh, committed an act of bankruptcy and I'm not insolvent. That would be their argument. All right. Okay, I see, I see. And that is started uh, in what court? I believe it's the master's court. So in Toronto right. where we operate, it's, it's 393 University. I apologize for this question. This probably, I probably veered now into, into the lawyer's area. And you yeah. of course are a trustee, <laughs> not a lawyer. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, but no it problem. just shows how, how technical and uh, uh, potentially complex this area of insolvency, yeah. this area of um let's say protecting assets and law right um uh, is and i really urge everyone to consult a bankruptcy trustee insolvency uh, specialist or a lawyer uh, about their own particular case because we can only talk in very very general terms to give you a taste right. of of how interesting this area is uh one last question one last question uh, Tom is about CRA. Uh, we yeah. all love the CRA, and we all know yeah. that the uh, CRA has a special role to play. Often, um, how are debts owing to Canada Revenue agencies treated in bankruptcy? Yeah, great question. So, um, Canada obviously uh, Canada Revenue Agency is the collection arm of the government, right? That's how the government builds roads. You know, pays pays for government programs, et cetera. So they um, play a very important role in collecting from Canadians uh, to, to individuals and businesses so that the, uh, that the, that the country can continue to operate. Um, because of that, they have significant powers, collection powers, far greater than any individual or corporate you know, litigant or, or other creditor. Um, so in terms of their power um, and, and their debt collection tools, um, in, in the what I see in my practice is that if a company owes CRA money, let's say they owe them half a million bucks in in HST for whatever reason, CRA can do a few things. If the company owns real property, they can register a lien on title to the real property. Uh, they they can garnish bank accounts. So in, in cash businesses, so like restaurants, sorry, not cash businesses, but businesses that depend on their cash flow through an, uh, a point of sale uh, machine, such as restaurants, CRA's main tool for them is they garnish the bank account, right? So now uh, your bank account is frozen. Even if you get credit card receipts that are dumped into that account, CRA just continues to collect them. Uh, and the third, and, and what I would say the most critical thing to prevent, and I've seen it you know, destroy businesses, is CRA can issue enhanced garnishments to the company's uh, customers. And essentially what they say is that receivable that's owing to the debtor company is now property of the CRA. Um, and the debtor and, and the customer has to pay that to the CRA. If they don't, they become liable. Mm -hmm. So what this does is two things. One, it, it's, it strips the company of their ability to collect its AR and continue to operate with positive cash flow. And two, it notifies all of the creditors that they're in trouble with the CRA <laughs> and effectively cuts the legs out from underneath them. So it really makes it difficult to, to operate uh, in, in that environment. Um, so, so those are the three main uh, debt collection tools that I see from CRA. And then in terms of how the debts are, um, are treated. So at a corporate level, generally speaking, there's three debts. There's corporate tax, HST, and source deductions. Source deductions being the amounts that are withheld from employees and, and are to be remitted to the CRA. Um, the HST and corp tax are unsecured debts. In a proposal, 
or bankruptcy, the source deductions, and it's written directly into the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, the source deductions are deemed trust that, mm. that, that are in priority to every creditor, whether secured or unsecured. Mm -hmm. So de source deductions have ultimate priority. Right. Um, HST, of course, is a director liability. So if, if a company owes HST and it's put into bankruptcy or just stops operating, CRA will uh, 99 times out of 100 assess the director for the HST. Uh, and the source deductions, and then the director or directors uh, will become personally liable for that that uh, that, that HST. Right. Um, and then uh, at the personal level, if the individual owes HST or um, personal income tax, those are unsecured debts that that you can compromise in a bankruptcy or, or in a proposal. Mm -hmm. Wow. This is a huge topic. Uh, personally, to me, it's very interesting. I could go on and on, but I want to respect Tom's time. And uh, I want to say big thanks to Tom for uh, sharing this information with us today. Um, Tom, if any of our viewers want to reach you um, uh, to talk about their particular case, how can they do it? Yeah, th thanks, Bill. So my... Uh, my address is tmac so t-m-c-e-l-r-y at albertgelman.com uh, we've got a website albertgelman.com you can go there all of my contact information is there that's great thank you so much tom that's a wrap thank you very much Paul. i really appreciate the opportunity thank you thank you